make sense with what had to be done for the welfare of the American people and the integrity of the health care system. And third, I live in New York, and it's December, and we're in Las Vegas. <laughs> and that's good for my health, too. I was laughing yesterday, I played golf in Washington with President Obama. And it was cold, dark, windy. He shows up, you know, thin clothes. I show up in my thermal underwear. <laughs> I said, you know, when I was a kid growing up, I could never figure out why people retired from Florida. Why would anybody live wherever they were, leave wherever they were living, and their friends and their roots, the memories of their children, and go someplace just because it was warm all the time? I get it. <laughs> I, uh, I want to talk a little today. I know we're going to have a question and answer session later. But I would like to try to uh, talk about health care and talk about health care in America in the context of what I do with my foundation. You got a little flavor of it in the, in the film. This is a profoundly important issue for any number of reasons. It is obviously for America critical to the health and well-being of our people. It's also critical to the health and well-being of our economy. In the last two years, we've had about 4% inflation in health care costs for the first time in 51 years. And that's really important because we spend almost 18% of our income on health care. And no other large wealthy country spends more than 11 and 8. That's about a trillion dollars a year. With a 6% difference in GDP. About four years ago, McKinsey and company did an analysis of where the difference was, and there hasn't been anything that comprehensive since, but more or less it's like this. About 20% of it is due to administrative costs borne by providers, insurers, and employers because of the way we finance health care. It's a massive increase in them paperwork costs, which doubtless a lot of you deal with. It's about $200 billion a year, no small change. And about uh, more than 20% of it is rooted in our lifestyle choices. We spend more than $150 billion a year now just dealing with type 2 diabetes and its attendant consequences which the American Medical Association said three years ago could no longer be referred to as adult onset diabetes. I knew that because we had just had a nine-year-old girl in New York City in Harlem diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And about the same time, there was a nine-year-old boy in Washington, D.C. diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. That was another thing a lot of you have seen. About 40% of the difference is due to the way we deliver, manage, and price health care. And about 15% is everything else, including the fact that we spent more on the last six months of life than other people. But that's always struck me as kind of creepy because a lot of times you don't know it's the last six months. <laughs> and. Um, I think the only answer to that in a country that believes we have a moral obligation to live as long as well as we can is to convince everybody to have a good will. That would make a significant difference if a huge percentage of us did. After my father-in-law had a terrible stroke, which left him with very little brain function, but he was a very tough old bird and he hung on for 40 days, he hung on for 10 days after all the major life supports were removed. It, the first thing Hillary and I did was go home and make out the new wills. So I think that would make a, a difference. There's one thing I, I want to say that's particularly troubling to me, but it shows that there's an overlap between our economic and social conditions and the health and welfare of the American people. 
Now, 10 days before the election, last November, I guess it was late October, on the front page of the New York Times, there was a story which achieved almost no notoriety because it was written as a healthcare piece, although I thought it should have been written as an economic piece. It said that America's life expectancy is continuing to rise for all groups except one, non-Hispanic whites who don't have any education beyond high school or who have dropped out of high school. For them, there has been a stunning four-year drop in life expectancy in the last 22 years among women and about three and a half years among men. The article, again, written as a healthcare article said, there were three major causes. One is, in this group only, the big increase in smoking, and more among women than men, which seem to account for the differential. Second, a big increase in obesity and its attendance consequences. Even though the obesity levels were still high among Hispanics and African Americans. And third, a larger than average increase in mortality from prescription drug overdoses or other misuses. But they could have said these people are dying of a broken heart because they're the people who were raised to believe that the American dream would be theirs if they worked hard and their children would have a chance to do better. And their dreams were dashed disproportionate to the population as a whole. I say that because in the work I do around the world today in healthcare and in economic development and in education and in a number, number of other areas, especially related to energy and climate change, I see the intersection of health, economics, and politics all the time. And I'm sure you do too. So, what I'd like to do is to start with this, the overview of how I came to do this healthcare work. It grew out of the way I view the world we're living in. It's a good news, bad news story. We live in the most interdependent age in human history, where people and ideas and information and technology and culture Across national borders, where all the borders look more like nets than walls, where the most successful countries were increasing in diversity. I mean, look around this room. We had this meeting 30 years ago. This crowd would not be nearly as diverse as it is today. It's a more interesting world, and it's fascinating. And for those of us who can claim its benefits, there's never been a better time to be alive. But it had three huge challenges. You may think there are three dozen or three hundred, but they're all more or less broken down into three categories. First of all, there is way too much inequality to maintain a sense of social cohesion. Inequality in income, access to employment, access to capital to start a business, access to education past a certain point, and too often access to decent health care. In the United States, there's been a big increase since I left office, and there was before, in the number of people living in poverty, especially children, and people working full time. Around the world, about half of those people still live on two dollars a day or less. A billion people go to bed hungry every night. A billion people have no access to clean water. Two and a half billion people have no access to sanitation. I spent a lot of my life working in Haiti. The real reason we've got a cholera epidemic there is the absence of sanitation and clean water. So I see these inequalities, and I see how they work their way into the lives of the people in America and around the world. You want to have some inequality in society if you believe, as I do, that a market economy is the most efficient way to generate wealth and employment and give people opportunities. But
But if there is too much inequality, it not only really crushes the people who are on the short end of the stick, it operates as a severe constraint on economic growth. It limits the number of consumers. And I'll bet you've seen that in your work as well. So the trick is, how do you have a market economy with enough inequality to reward people who are especially hardworking or especially creative or especially good managers or the people that we feature in Vegas, the great entertainers, the great athletes, without having so much that you slowly choke off the goose that laid the golden egg. And it's a challenge everywhere in the world. The second big problem is that there is too much instability. Again, in any dynamic society, you want some instability. For example, if you were to reward a person who starts a little company with an SDA loan that becomes Intel, there has to be the prospect of failure. That's why we have bankruptcy laws so people can begin again, if necessary. So some instability is built in our system, and it's a good thing. But if the financial crisis ship, which spread across the world in a split second, if there is too much instability, you might as well have total rigidity, because either way, things just shut down because people are scared to take a risk, scared to make an investment. Even now, we're, as we begin to come out of this financial crisis, we have American banks with over a trillion and a half dollars of cash not committed to loans. Still wary of getting back in there. People wary of borrowing money to start a new business. It's the overhang of what happened in the financial crisis when there was too much money loaned with too little capital to back it up. You see it in the vulnerability people feel to terrorism, to drugs, to destructive forces which can cross national borders. You see it in countries, thank goodness, more in other places in America, where immigration has created enclaves of people who come to a new country but still want to live with their own people. So there are religious and cultural and racial and ethnic tensions because the borders look more like nets than walls, all right. But once people live in the same proximity with people who have different views, they tend to erect metal walls. I read a book a couple of years ago that I recommend to all of you. It's a fascinating book about a much less toxic but still problematic American version of that, which we're seeing played out in this political fight in Washington now. It's called The Big Sort, S-O-R-T, written by a Texas journalist named Bill Bishop. Bishop was a confessed liberal Democrat who lived in a neighborhood in Austin, Texas, where John Kerry defeated President Bush three to one. He had one Republican neighbor. He loved the guy. Their children played together. They took a walk every day. He said, he's the only guy I can have a discussion where I had a disagreement, but I might actually learn something. He learned something from me. Unfortunately, my other neighbors weren't so nice to him, so he moved to another neighborhood in Austin where President Bush defeated John Kerry four to one. And the conclusion of Bishop's book is, look, we are so past a lot of our past victories. We're not as sexist or as racist or as homophobic as we used to be. Now we just don't want to be around anybody that disagrees with us. <laughs> <laughs> we're laughing, but we're all a little left way, aren't we? <laughs> and the point Bishop made was, when that guy moved out of our neighborhood into the other neighborhood, we all lost. And then he started doing research. And he looked at the voting patterns of counties, because unlike congressional districts, county lines, you know, they say safe and they say the same. So in 1976, when President Carter and President Ford had a razor-close 
presidential election. There were only 20% of the counties in America that voted for either one of them by 20 points or more. So in 80% of the counties, you could go in a barber shop, a beauty shop, a restaurant, a bowling alley, go to your local civic club meeting, and people were actually sitting around discussing the election with their friends and neighbors, trying to figure out what the right thing to do was. By 2004, we don't have any data, at least I don't, on the last two elections, but by 2004, when you had another razor thin election, and President Bush got the smallest re-election margin of any re-elected president since Woodrow Wilson in 1916, 48% of the counties in America voted for one or the other of them by more than 20 points. We are really sorting ourselves by our politics and by our view of the world. And so I would argue that contributes to instability, not stability. But anyway, you can see it. You can see it in our vulnerability to terror, to to drugs, to financial crises. There is a high level of instability, and if we feel too threatened by it, and we draw into a shell, it robs us of a lot of the potential of the 21st century world. And we're scared to get talking to somebody that disagrees with us. And we're scared we'll be shunned if we make an agreement with them. And that's a little bit of what's going on in Washington today. Not good for anyone. The third problem the world has is that the way we produce and consume energy is causing climate change and it is not sustainable. We can preserve a global market economy, we can create more opportunity for people, but we've got to change the way we produce and consume energy. And nearly everybody in the world has accepted this, which is why there are so many changes. This is the only country in the world where any major political party actually still questions whether it's real. Everywhere else, the conservatives and liberals are debating what to do about it. For example, Sweden had a conservative government, not a liberal government, in 1991, when they adopted the world's first carbon tax. And they had a perfectly conservative tax, and the only tax in history anywhere where they gave them, they just taxed you, you paid the tax, and they gave it all back to you. It was an ingenious experiment. They said, we just want every person in this country to understand the damage they do to our future by the carbon they emit. And we trust them, not the government, we trust them to do what's best. So if you have a bill for $1,000, the government gave you $1,000 back. They said, now you know, you want to spend it like you did last year? Have yeah, that. But you ought to spend it on becoming more efficient so our country will be stronger over the long run. They then proceeded to have a few years where the economy grew by 50% and they reduced their greenhouse gas emissions while growing the economy. With no laws, no regulation, no nothing, they just sent everybody a bill for their carbon footprint every year, gave them the money back, and said, we trust you. And sure enough, they built one of the most energy efficient countries in the world. So there are all, the, there are all these things going on. But I, if you look at this Hurricane Sandy, that was still a terrible storm to hit New York. It's an example of what has been happening for 20 years now. In the decade when I was president, insured its losses, that is, those insurance companies had to pay them, were three times greater worldwide than they had ever been before. Then in the 10 years after I left office, they were three times greater than the previous decade. You cannot say that global warming caused any of these storms. But what you can say is it makes them more severe. All you got to do is stick a thermometer in the ocean because we know warmer water boils more. So what are the things that might have made it worse this year, just for example? 8% of the world's fresh water is on top of Greenland. 
And if an old bell flows into the North Atlantic, it could completely block the Gulf Stream, which is the warm water and the tin air that flows north and keeps Northern Europe, Northern Canada, and the Northeast United States livable and functional in cold months. If that happened, particularly in the Northern European countries, some of the most productive countries on Earth, it could make them as cold as they were 700 years ago while the west of the planet's warmed up. It would be calamitous. So the good news is, in a couple of years, you'll be able to take a boat every summer across the North Pole. The bad news is, in a couple of years, you'll be able to take a boat across the North Pole in the summer. This year, 90% of the ice cap on Greenland showed some melting. The 100 year average is 50%. It almost certainly slowed the Gulf Stream, which created an air war in, on the East Coast. Usually, a hurricane like Sandy would have hit Haiti, which it did, and which had more lost lives than we did. And now, those of us that are helping have to go down and try to pick up the pieces and resume the progress. But we all know that at this time of year, the wind blows hard from west to east. So I got up this morning at 5 o'clock, left my house at 6. Dude, if we flew out here, it took me 45 minutes longer than it normally would because we had a huge hit. It just happens. Normally what happens is when these hurricanes come up, this wind blows them out to sea. And what happened with Sandy is it didn't blow it out to sea because there was a blocking wall there. So I spent a lot of my life trying to figure out how to make this good economics. How could we find ways to change the way we produce and consume energy in poor countries and wealthy countries that are good economics? For example, in America, the cheapest thing we can do is retrofit all of our buildings. That's a big portion of what we've been. In the rest of the world, the cheapest thing we can do is to close every landfill in every big city in the world, to stop cooking with charcoal and wood, and make sure these room air conditioners don't emit CFCs and HFCs, because those things together are about as big a problem as coal, and you can get them out of the air a lot quicker. But the point of all this is the following. This brings you back to healthcare. If you believe that we're living in a fine time of unprecedented opportunity, that if extended it too few, it gets shut down too much by instability, it can be shut cut short by the problems associated with climate change, then the clear mission of everybody in the 21st century world, whatever you're doing, is to build up the positive forces of our interdependence to take advantage of the fact that the world looks more like borders that are nets than borders that are walls, and to reduce the negative forces. And that's how I think about trying to deal with the healthcare challenge. I, just, I want to make one more point that I think is really important before we move to the questions and I say a few specific things about America. Dealing with these kind of problems in a very poor place is very different than dealing with them in a the world of other countries. Like, poor countries need systems that have predictable positive results for good conduct. I mean, just think about the systems that none of you have thought about yet today. You would be shocked if the screen failed and those of you in the back that like me need glasses couldn't see it. If the temperature controls went on the blink and all this hot air I'm putting out in my general country. <laughs> if the microphone failed or the lights went dark. Then if you get bored with my speech, you can get up and go to the restroom. And while there, if you had a cup, you could drink a glass of water without giving it a second thought. I spent a lot of my life in places where not a single thing I just mentioned can be taken for granted by anybody. Those people need systems. 
So, for example, in Rwanda, where I work with partners in health to build a hospital in every region of the country, they still have a real problem. They've got a country with over 10 million people, only 630 doctors. So we got this unprecedented partnership going with 13 different American universities, medical schools, people with trained nurses and other medical professionals. And we are going there to help train people for a model national healthcare system that the Rwandans can afford. We've got a hospital in every region now, including one, thanks to the American Race Car Driver, Jeff Gordon, that provides the best cancer care anywhere in Central Africa. And then they're going to build satellite clinics that are just going to be a couple of hours walk from the hospitals. And then in the poor and vulnerable villages, they will train community health workers to go out there and identify basic problems so they know who to send to the clinics and then they'll move to send to the hospital. And we have to train a lot of people to run the system. So they asked me to figure out what the most economical way to do it was. These 13 American medical centers agreed to do this work for two years, unbelievably, for a total overhead of 7%. That is less than a fourth of what non government organizations usually charge to work in other countries. And it's a real triumph. But we're trying to build a system because we're one that's determined to be free of all foreign aid by 2020. And that's what you want. You want to, when you work in a country, you want to work yourself out of a job so people can stand on their own two feet and do their own business. So anyway, that's typical of what we did. When I started working in Ethiopia, a country with more than 80 million people, 60% of them live in more than 60,000 villages fewer than 100 people, fewer than 1,000 people. And in those 60,000 villages, there were a grand total of 700 clinics in 60,000 villages. So if you flew to Addis Ababa tonight, and God forbid you got food poisoning on the airplane, you'd be fine when you landed because they have a good health care system in the capital. If you met the Ethiopian health care minister, health minister, and you spend 30 minutes with him, you would say, I'd feel comfortable that that man with the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the United States. He's that good, and so is the woman who runs the health care system in Rwanda. But it's like falling off a cliff when you left the town. So I said, what do you want us to do? They said, we build us 3,500 clinics, and then everybody will be at least within a day's walk of health care. I said, how many have to get to three hours? They said 16,000. We'll cross that bridge when we come to But you see what I mean? It's a system building thing. Now, in a place like the United States, or Europe, or any other advanced society, we've got systems. That's how we all got here today. That's what got you into these chairs. But, since time immemorial, you go back 8,000 years in Sumerian civilization, it's the same thing, this is just human nature. Once you build systems, they reach a point when they become too rigid, they're not as changeable because there are too many people benefiting from the way things are. So people are more interested in holding on to where they are and advancing the purpose for which the systems were established in new circumstances. So the trick in this whole healthcare deal is how do we advance the purpose for which all of you got into this? How can we provide affordable quality health care to all Americans at a price which leaves enough money left for the economy to continue to grow it and invest in education and enable people to raise their kids? Huge headline in USA Today about two months ago saying that the principal reason that Millions of Americans work the entire last decade without a pay raise. Is that their employers are spending all their excess revenue paying for health insurance premiums and they didn't have enough left to give them a pay raise? So we have the need for system reform. And I just have a, a couple of observations on that, if I might. One is it's really important that 
that this group do whatever you can to make sure that we implement this Affordable Care Act properly. And if there are things that are wrong with it, both with the way the law is written or the way the regulations come out, that you move as quickly and aggressively as you can because you are trusted, I believe, by both parties in Washington as people who are really interested in making the system work, that you be active in that. It's one thing to pass a law and another thing altogether to change lives in a way that is possible. There's often a, a big gap. You know that old saying, as many slip between the cup and the lip. And it is inconceivable that Albert Einstein alone in the room could not have dealt with a matter of this complexity without forgetting to do something or doing something that would have an unintended consequence. So I think that's really important. The second thing I think is important is that we need your help to make sure that these magnificent advances in pharmaceuticals actually work to make people healthier and are coupled with changes in lifestyle. My major healthcare initiative is something called the Alliance for a Healthy Generation. And I started with the Heart Association after I had my heart surgery. And they wanted me to help them, and I said, look, I'll do it, but I'm not interested in doing PSAs or just raising money. I want to deal with this problem. This is a horrible problem. So, make a long story short, after about six years now, we've got programs in 15,000 schools changing the health habits of both the students as well as the faculty and staff, trying to increase exercise. Because we've cut deals with major providers of food because as the schools have become more cash strapped, more and more of them have contracted out their meals. And what they were contracting out was terrible. And before the new standards the federal government has imposed just this year on food, we had voluntary agreements with companies feeding 30 million children in school to reduce the caloric content and increase the nutritional value of the meal. And most important, about five years ago, we made an agreement with the big salt drink providers, which now encompass more than 95% of the schools in America. And just last year, an independent review, none having nothing to do with us, said that there has been a 90 a 90% reduction in the total calories served in children in schools through drinks, both soft drinks and juice. And it was all voluntary. We just basically got together like we did when we cut the class of age drug and said, look, we know you're not trying to kill these kids. We know you don't want them to have diabetes and, and be amputees when they're in their 30s. We know you want them to keep drinking salt drinks for their lifetime. What we're doing is not working. And if you all change together, you can make money in a different way. Same thing we do with providers of age drugs. I never ask anybody to lose money. I just ask them to make money in a different way that's good for the public health. And so they got rid of all the full sugar drinks. They went to smaller servings of juice that had a lot of sugar in it. They went to more flavored water. They went to, they did a lot of very clever things. They're all still making money. And there's been a 90% reduction in the glory content. We need. amazing how many people listen to their pharmacists. They don't have a relationship with some of them people with the doctors. They listen to you. We gotta stay at this. We can't blame the medical system for costs and burdens that we impose on that through decisions we make. And so that's important. In my latest uh, healthcare venture, I have no idea whether we can succeed in it, but uh, we had so much good fortune with this other event, uh, this other effort, I decided to try it. 
is called Health Matters, and we're trying to basically get the non-youth population involved in the same kind of behavior changes and get the people that are feeding in bad elements to change what they're doing. And, uh, we started last year, but we're I'm going to particularly focus on baby boomers because I'm the oldest of the baby boomers. <laughs> I hate it, but it's true. <laughs> and if we consider health care dollars on a per capita basis at the same rate as the generation older than us, we're going to bankrupt the system no matter what else everybody else does. We simply have to stay healthy. So if we take more medication, it's got to be medication First of all, it's properly reconciled that works, and it keeps us out of the hospital. It keeps us out of surgery. It keeps us out of being a burden to our children and their ability to raise our grandchildren. It is profoundly important. And so we're going to have in January, and associated with Humana and some others that have helped us with the old Bob Hope Golf Tournament in Southern California, we're going to have this big conference and kick off what we're doing, and I, I hope we can really have a difference, make a difference there. And I've tried to respond also to this report that I mentioned at the outset of my talk about where life expectancy is declining, and particularly on this prescription drug business. I don't know if any of you saw it, but last night, Sanjay Gupta on CNN re-ran a special he did on the prescription drug problem. I participated in almost exactly a year ago in the space of 10 days. My across the street neighbor, who's a Kosovar Albanian immigrant, who's relatives within the government of Kosovo and therefore are close to them because we saved their country in 1999, had five children, four girls, and a boy, and his youngest son, 30 died within 10 days of one of my closest friends, 28-year-old son, who was working for my wife, that neither one of them intended to kill themselves. They both went out with their girlfriends, drank a few beers, and thought they'd get a buzz by popping a moxie cop, and they never woke up. One was not particularly well educated. The other was in a program at George Washington University to get a law degree and an MBA. And I had known him since he was a boy. And I am 100% certain that neither one of those young men thought he was committing suicide. I am 100% certain that they did not know the basic biochemistry that the two things would mix could deaden the part of the brain that keeps your body breathing when you're asleep. You know all this, and you probably have your own stories. But this is the sort of thing that we can change. You can change the culture. <coughs> yes, there are some people who have knowingly abused these prescriptions and violated the law doing it, and our biggest problems were probably in California and Florida, and there's been an attempt in New York, there's been an attempt to crack down on it. But you can help with this. We simply cannot afford to continue to do things which cause human loss with medications that are supposed to alleviate human suffering. And these are all things we have to own. We can't blame the politicians, can't blame the health insurance companies, can't blame anybody for stuff that is in our control if we don't do everything we can. If we do everything we can, and we're still being frustrated, and we can look for somebody else to blame. But I found it more productive to look for something positive to do. So that's what I wanted to say to you. The job in a rich country is to reform our system. We're now trying to reform our federal budget system, our health care system, our national defense in the 21st century. We're reforming our financial rules so we don't have another financial crash. We're in the reform business. And the better we do it, the stronger America will be in the future. On the health care front, we need your help. And you have proved to me over two decades that you really do care about the purpose for which you went into this work. We need that kind of purpose-driven reform today. Thank you.
Thank you very much.